Hello students and welcome to my unit three video for AP Biology on Cellular Energetics. This is a big one. I encourage you to pause the video often and to ask yourself questions. This, like all my other videos, is not for profit. It's just meant to help students. Um, most of the slides I made myself, a few I got from other places. I tried to use images from OpenStax and Khan Academy. Uh, it's going to cover the laws of thermodynamics, enzymes, cellular respiration, and photosynthesis. Good luck as you prepare for your AP biology test. What is energy? It's a surprisingly complex question. In our class here at TASM, the American International School, we're just thinking of energy as the chemicals that we bring in in the form of carbohydrates and fats, right? We just, this is, I'm recording this over the Thanksgiving holiday here. So you might've brought in a lot of chemical energy. We're then going to uh, break down that chemical energy into ATP that we can use in our body, that's our energy currency. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in our cells. Uh, the byproduct of many of these reactions is going to be heat, but also to uh, build things up and to make things for our body. All of these reactions must obey the laws of thermodynamics. So what are those? If you haven't had physics yet, thermodynamics is a study of energy and energy transfer involving physical matter. And this comes right from the OpenStack slides that I downloaded as an instructor. The first law states that the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. So energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can just change forms. The second law of thermodynamics states that the transfer energy is not completely efficient. Some of it is always lost as heat. Um, with each chemical reaction, some energy is lost in a form that is unusable, such as heat energy. And this results in an increase in entropy. So I often joke that my classroom and my house is uh, in, always full of entropy, that it's going to tend towards disorder over time just because we're busy people. So here would be an example of a tree, right? And it is uh, tending towards entropy once it is uh, no longer functioning. Here would be another example, would be leaving some ice water out at room temperature, going to a more random state. So here's an interesting question for you. How do organisms not violate the second law of thermodynamics? We tend to think of ourselves as a system, right? We tend to really view things through just a human lens. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else, um, but we're part of a bigger system. So while we might make ourselves more ordered, we tend to make the universe, we don't tend, we make the universe at large more random. All right, what is metabolism? Right? I know I want to highlight if I eat donuts, I already gave you the definition as to some of the chemical reactions, but let's think about them and what they are. They are anabolic reactions, which are going to build things up. And so I always remember that from anabolic steroids came on the scene when I was a young baseball fan. And then all of a sudden, all the baseball players are huge. Catabolic are breaking things down. And I just think about cats. My cat at my home breaks everything apart, um, which is interesting that we still, uh, that we, well, anyway. So it's catabolic, it's uh, energy is released as we break down big molecules into small ones. In ninth grade biology, I kept using a battery example that um, ATP is going to have three phosphates attached to an adenine and it's going to be a charged battery. And then that those uh, third phosphate, as you break it off, it can release some energy and that can go do something in a cell. Um, here in AP Biology, and if you're taking chemistry, you know it's really the formation of bonds that um, releases energy. But you can still think about it in the same way, that ATP is going to lose a phosphate, and that's going to give off energy that can drive a reaction. So in biology, we're going to use exergonic reactions, or ones that release energy to drive those that require energy or that are endergonic. An example. Right? We always learn through examples. An example would be the sodium potassium pump. So here we're moving sodium against its concentration gradient. So it would be low here and high out here. So that doesn't happen um, without the input of energy. So this ATP is going to be under go hydrolysis and give off energy when it loses that third phosphate to pump the sodium against your concentration gradient and likewise for the potassium. Um, this slide I did get from a review that was done last year. It was excellent. You can find it on YouTube. I'll try and link to it. Um, but the exergonic reactions will help to break things down into simpler molecules. That requires less organization, fewer bonds, and there's free energy left over to do work. 
if you're um, really attuned to chemistry stuff, these are actually going to make stronger bonds, right, in the products. Inorganic reactions are going to um, be the synthesis of larger, more complex molecules. The level of organization increases, more bonds are formed, and a net input of energy is required to do this. So before we get to the next slides, can you think about which one is cellular respiration and which one is photosynthesis? Okay. Here's a great graph um, from OpenStax, and this text is from OpenStax as well. Exergonic reactions. So um, you used to have to know about Gibbs free energy, but we don't need to anymore. But we can know in general what's going on here. Uh, Exergonic reactions are spontaneous because they can occur without the addition of energy. However, they do not necessarily occur quickly. Um, you do have to get over this uh, activation energy um, right here. And so here would be the reactants, here would be the products. You can think about this in the terms of cellular respiration. This could be glucose, and then here would be carbon dioxide and water. This energy given off will be used to make ATP. Endergonic reactions require the addition of energy. So here would be the reactants, and here would be the products. Let's think about this in terms of photosynthesis. The reactants would be carbon dioxide and water and sunlight and then with the uh, energy from sunlight, it's going to be able to make the uh, higher energy product of glucose. In our cells, a lot of times, uh, the hydrolysis of ATP is going to be this added energy. All right, activation energy, I mentioned it earlier, is the energy required for a reaction to proceed. All right, it causes reactants to become contorted and unstable, which allows the bonds to be broken and for this process to happen. Now, when you add an enzyme, then the uh, activation energy is reduced and the reaction is able to happen a lot more quickly. So we're going to get to enzymes in just a second. But let's look at this graph and we can think about it in terms of hydrogen peroxide. So when you buy hydrogen peroxide at a store, you buy it and it's in a brown bottle. And that's because if you leave it out over time, um, the sunlight will help to contort these bonds and break it into water and oxygen. So it comes from H2O2 into water and oxygen. But if you add an enzyme or something to lower the activation energy, it can happen much more quickly. And so um, this year we had to do it kind of virtually, uh, but the, and I did it as a demonstration, I added catalase. The um, enzyme, I, I got it from uh, just putting some, activating some yeast you can also extract it from potatoes, et cetera. Almost all living things have catalase. And it's going to break apart the hydrogen peroxide into uh, water and oxygen much more quickly. So a lot of times, heat energy is the main source for activation energy in the cell, and it helps the reactants reach their transition state. So once they're in a transition state, it happens very quickly. So a little bit of heat will make these reactants uh, turn into products. This is an exergonic reaction giving off energy. Enzymes help, uh, like I said earlier, with the hydrogen peroxide, are going to make reactions happen at a rate that can sustain life. And so um, oftentimes when I wish you a happy birthday, I say, go use your sucrase enzyme, right? And that's going to break down sucrose or sugar um, into monosaccharides that your body can digest. And so these enzymes are proteins that make them happen. And so let's get into it without further ado. What should you know about enzymes? You should know how they work, the lock and key model, the induced fit model, and how they lower activation energy. You should be able to use the vocabulary. You should be able to describe the reaction rates and things that affect them, and enzyme concentration, substrate concentration, temperature, and pH. Here is where you really need to develop your scientific skills of graphing. Um, there are tons of graphing questions about enzymes in AP Classroom and ways that you can practice, and I'm sure your review books had them as well. Cofactors, I just know in general that um, enzymes often use vitamins like calcium and zinc to affect their structure and hence their function, that they can be inhibited. And so this will deal with regulation. Um, competitive inhibitors can bind reversibly or irreversibly to the active site of an enzyme that can block the reaction. Non-competitive inhibitors bind the allosteric sites, changing the activity of the enzyme. So I told you in class that you take your fingers and shove them in somebody's armpit, um, which you shouldn't do. Uh, you should not touch anybody else, but it would make them contort around and act silly. 
So that'd be like a non-competitive inhibitor. It doesn't hit the active site, but it hits somewhere else in the enzyme and causes it to change its shapes, right? And this would be, this is really important. If we couldn't regulate um, our metabolic pathways, such as glycolysis, then things would be chaotic. And so it's really important to regulate our body, it promotes homeostasis and AP biology, big idea, right? Often the end product inhibits a multi-step pathway. We'll see, see that in cellular respiration with ATP inhibiting many parts of it. For example, phosphofructokinase, we'll get to that. All right, let's just go over some uh, vocab real quick. So down here, it's covered up, but this would be the um, enzyme. And here is the substrate. The substrate is going to fit into the active site and become products. Um, enzymes do not always break things down. Enzymes could also build them together, like DNA polymerase. Some properties. They're uh, specific to the reaction. So you have um, lots of enzymes in you, over a thousand per cell, right? And they're each going to do work with a specific substrate. And so it's because there's a very uh, specific fit between the active site and the substrate um, held there by hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds. They're not used up in the reaction. So a single enzyme molecule can catalyze thousands of more reactions per second and keep being used over and over again. Enzymes themselves are unaffected by the reaction. So that's really important, but they are affected by cellular conditions. Any condition that affects protein structure, because they are proteins. So anything that can change a protein can change an enzyme. So why don't you think about that for a second and see if you can come up with what they might be. Before you got things like temperature or pH that could affect uh, protein structure, right? You learned the four levels of protein structure and how it might um, alter R groups interacting in the tertiary structure, salinity, etc. All right, at the active site, there's a little shift in the shape when the substrates come in, and this is called the induced fit model. And so um, oftentimes in ninth grade biology, we just teach it as a lock and key. I, t I tell students, you know, you have the key to your house. Nobody else does. So you can open up your house as many times as you want to. The keys are reusable, but nobody else is going to get in there. Well, here we see that the actosite does slightly change when the uh, enzyme is working. That's called the induced fit model. And here's a picture of it. You can see here comes the substrates in. Um, this is from OpenStax, and there's a, just a slight change in shape here as it's catalyzing the reaction. All right, so we talked that enzymes are really important. Let's go back to this graph because they are lowering activation energy. And so here is the graph, All right? So with this enzyme, it's going to, uh, the green one, this is one of those AP classroom questions that you checked out, and the purple one um, without the enzyme, right? So enzymes make it so that we can live, right? Because they're going to make these reactions happen at a speed that can sustain life. So let's learn about now how they lower the activation energy. We talked about what they are, how they uh, work, um, what can affect them. So how can it make our reaction more likely to happen? This comes from OpenStax. It can position two substrates so they align perfectly for the action provide an optimal environment, be acidic or polar within the active site for the reaction. It can stress the substrate, so it's less stable, and more likely to react. And it can temporarily react with the substrate itself, chemically changing it, making it less stable and more likely to react. After the reaction, the product is released, and then the enzyme is ready to do another reaction. All right, these um, come from a legendary AP biology teacher, Ms. Foglia. And so let's go over a uh, couple of questions here. As this graph is showing the reaction rate on the y-axis and enzyme concentration on the x-axis, why does it level off after a while? Why doesn't it just increase uh, linearly or even exponentially? And so you should think about it and you should try and construct an argument. And then I would encourage you to draw it out um, like is done on this slide. So as the level of enzyme increases, the reaction rate increases. That makes sense. Right? More enzymes, they'll more frequently collide with the substrates, grounding motion inside a cell, and they'll make the reaction happen. But eventually, the reaction rate will level off because there isn't enough substrate for all the enzyme molecules. They can't all find a substrate, so substrate becomes a limiting factor. Um, we often do limiting factors with rates of photosynthesis. Um, once again, we didn't get to really do the lab this year because of uh, COVID, but uh, we'll talk about it. Substrate concentration. 
can you say why this level's off? And hopefully, yeah, uh, kind of the same thing, right? As the amount of substrate goes up, the reaction rate will go up. There's more substrate, there's more frequent collisions with the enzymes. Remember, the enzymes can be used over and over and over again. But at some point, all the enzymes will be catalyzing reactions. So adding more substrate won't increase it at a, a certain point. You can think about substrate and enzyme concentration like a factory producing cars. You know, if you add, um, uh, let's say, more windshields and chassis and other parts to the line, it'll increase, maybe it'll increase production rate at a certain point, but at some point, the production line can only go so fast. As a little bit of a jacked up analogy there, but you could probably improve it, which would be good. Okay, temperature. So what's happening here? Why is 37 degrees Celsius important? So the optimum temperature is the greatest number of molecular collisions. And so um, in our many enzymes have evolved to work in 37 degrees Celsius because that's what our body is, the enzymes inside of us, I should be clear. Um, but if you increase uh, beyond the optimum temperature, right, then you can denature the enzyme. And so it wouldn't work. It can also um, disrupt the bonds in the uh, Actocyte between the enzyme and the substrate. And then if it gets too cold, right, the molecules are just going to move around slower and it's going to decrease those collisions. So we have quite a few physics minded students in our class. I'm trying to think about that. Um, different enzymes function in different environments. So this is important, right? We tend to think that everything evolved for us, but that's definitely not true. Um, humans have been around a lot less long than many other things on this earth. And here would be uh, enzymes inside of the human versus the hot spring which is how we got the PCR to work. Okay, compounds which regulate enzyme activity. We have inhibitors. So, um, you can just think about the word inhibiting, slowing you down. And so here would be a competitive inhibitor, blocks the activocyte. Non-competitive might um, bind to an allosteric site, some, a place away from the activocyte. And these types of inhibition can be your irreversible or reversible, um, and they can also engage in feedback inhibition. So here's an example of a competitive inhibitor, and I think penicillin is a really good one. Um, it's going to block the active strike so that way an enzyme that bacteria use to build cell walls were not working, right? But of course, uh, that ties into evolution that now penicillin doesn't, isn't as effective as the antibiotic because bacteria have evolved. Uh, one way to overcome this is by increasing the substrate concentration level. So you should try and construct an argument with that. All right, non-competitive inhibitors would just bind to the actocyte. So here, increasing the substrate level like wouldn't work on it, right? Because all the enzymes are, are jacked up. Here, in this one, if you increase the substrate level, maybe it can outcompete the competitive inhibitor. Um, this is going to cause the enzyme to change shape. Uh, it's a conformational change. Um, it's going, you know, some examples of this would be different types of cancer drugs or cyanide poisoning. If you did that, um, Explore Learning Gizmo, uh, which we had an option of in classes, one of our virtual labs, dealing with cyanide and how, um, and Dr. E went over that with her presentation on the uh, Tylenol case study, which is very sad. So here, um, I put this slide in here from OpenStax because uh, allosteric isn't always an inhibitor. Sometimes allosteric can be an activator. So this is an enzyme and here, if this uh, this is like the fingers in the armpit, it's going to inhibit it. It's going to change the actocyte and not work. Here, the activator is actually going to make the enzyme ready to function. And so this can happen and work a lot with uh, uh, signaling pathways, you could say. All right, feedback inhibition. So here, the end product of the pathway inhibits an upstream step. And so I have a couple examples of those coming up in cellular respiration for you. But here you can see the end product, the orange square, is then going to go up and inhibit the uh, beginning of the pathway where um, the substrate binds with the enzyme. So that triangle substrate can now no longer get in there. So therefore it's going to, once it has enough of the end product, it says, hey, let's, let's, let's stop this. All right, um, a good example of regulation would be phosphoglutide kinase. It's the third step of glycolysis. Glycolysis has 10 different enzyme mediated reactions in it. And in this one, ATP and AMP are going to be regulators. So ATP is going to say, no, don't go on. We have enough energy in the cell. 
Whereas AMP is going to say, yes, please proceed uh, phosphorylfructokinase because we need more energy. That's pretty cool. All right, here we go on to cellular respiration. And so um, this is, a, it just drives me nuts when students get up in uh, a graduation speech or something and say mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's all I remember from biology. I hope you remember a lot more than that um, because you all are awesome students. So cellular respiration is dealing with uh, taking glucose and oxidizing it down into energy that we can use for cellular work. You should be able to describe why cellular respiration and photosynthesis are a cycle. And it's coming up in a later slide by me. What's the point of it? It's a redox reaction. We're going to oxidize glucose into carbon dioxide. Um, oxygen is going to be reduced into water. And the big point is that this is going to give off lots of energy and, that we can use to make ATP, uh, the body's energy currency. Oxidation in means the loss of electrons and reduction means the gain of electrons. So I think about this as oil rig is an easy way to remember. So the electrons are going to be taken away from glucose, put on carbon dioxide, oxygen uh, is, excuse me, the glucose is going to be oxidized. It's going to lose its electrons and the oxygen is going to be reduced. It's going to gain the electrons as it's formed into water. My apologies for it misspeaking there, but I cannot re-record re this video. I'll run out of time. All right, glycolysis is, uh, is the splitting of glucose into two pyruvates. This is universal. Um, all living things do glycolysis. So it came from the LUCA. It's going to give off ATP and NADH, so all living things use ATP as an energy source. All right, um, then from glycolysis, it's gonna go into pyruvate oxidation, or what's often called the link reaction where uh, the pyruvate will be modified into acetyl coenzyme A. We'll then enter the citric acid cycle and make lots of NADH and FADH2, a little bit of ATP and carbon dioxide. Those NADH and FADH2s are going to go to the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and there do the important process of oxidative phosphorylation. So let's get into it. Here are the 10 uh, enzyme mediated reactions of glycolysis. And so um, just to go over it real quickly, let's see uh, where is, here's phosphofructokinase, right? And so um, you can see the different uh, enzymes because the N and ASE that are used here in all these steps to convert glucose into two pyruvates. You do not need to memorize or know those enzymes. It is clearly said in the, um, course guideline outlook, but you should appreciate the enzymes that uh, do this. And you should think about this in terms of evolution because every living thing does glycolysis. This happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. So oftentimes the AP test will ask you, um, they'll say in this uh, cell fractionation, uh, this gly glycolytic enzyme is present, then you know, okay, okay, that's from the cytoplasm. It's not inside the mitochondria. Here is, I threw these in from Khan Academy to show some of the regulations. And so here's that phosphofructokinase. Um, here's the, uh, the arrow, the arrow means go, and then the dead end or the block means stop. And so ATP, which is an outcome of cellular respiration, or citrate, which is an outcome of the citric acid cycle, says stop phosphofructokinase. AMP says please go on, all right? And then here you can see, um, uh, likewise, in the link reaction, there is um, uh, the ADP or pyruvate is going to say, let's go pyruvate dehydrogenase, whereas lots of ATP is going to say, let's stop this. All right, and then here is uh, regulators and in the citric acid cycle. Um, you don't need to know these names or anything, but you can just see that, look at what's going on here, right? ATP and NADH, so ATP being energy currency and NADH mean high energy electron carriers are going to say, let's, let's stop this. Here's the link reaction that I told you about. Um, this is happening in the cytoplasm as well. Um, and so the pyruvate is going to lose one of its carbons as carbon dioxide. So think about a third of the carbon dioxide you breathe out comes from the link reaction and it's going to create, uh, or it's going to, well, here's a good chance for me to redeem myself. It's going to reduce NAD plus, it's going to 
uh, gain two electrons and a hydrogen proton, become NADH, and it's going to uh, become acetyl coenzyme A. And this is going to serve as fuel for the citric acid cycle. So here comes that acetyl coenzyme A. It's going to combine with oxaloacetate and become citrate. And so it's going to go through a series of eight steps. And as it goes around in a cycle, um, it's going to release carbon dioxide and it's going to make NADH and FADH2. And that's the big picture that you should get out of this. NADH carries uh, high energy electrons. It's a reduction from NAD plus to NADH. So it's going to gain two high energy electrons and a hydrogen proton. In FADH2, similarly, it's also an electron carrier and it's going to gain two high energy electrons and two hydrogen protons. I tell my students to think about them as taxi cabs, right? And they're carrying um, the electrons around. And so it might be two different taxi companies like Uber and Lyft, all right? And so here I said, you just need to know the reactants and the products. You don't even need to know the numbers of them. You just need to think big picture what comes out of the citric acid cycle, trying to fill as many electron carriers as possible for the electron transport chain. All right, uh, one thing that's important is along the way in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, you've engaged in substrate level phosphorylation. That's where an enzyme is going to take a phosphate from a substrate and tack it onto adenosine diphosphate to turn it into ATP. This is gonna make four ATP. Um, so it makes a small amount of ATP for the cell and then oxidative phosphorylation through the process of chemoosmosis will make a lot more. We went over a couple of cellular respiration efficiency problems in class dealing with this. All right, here is uh, chemoosmosis. So here's the big picture. Let me see if I have another one after this. Yes. All right. So let's talk about what's going on here. So NADH is going to come and it's going to be oxidized, right? It's going to lose its electrons to complex one. So it loses two high energy electrons and a hydrogen proton. These high energy electrons can be shuttled through uh, these uh, complexes or carrier proteins. As they move through the carrier proteins, they are going to use their energy to pump hydrogen protons or hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. So notice how there's a low number of hydrogen protons here and a high here that's going against their gradient that requires energy. So the high energy electrons from NADH as they move through these complexes will pump hydrogen protons into the intermembrane space. FADH2 drops its electrons off at complex two and it will uh, pump slightly fewer hydrogen proton uh, ions than NADH. These hydrogen protons or these uh, hydrogen ions will diffuse through ATP synthase. Um, ATP synthase will then uh, turn and it will phosphorylate or add a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. Right? So this, you can think about it as water flowing through a dam and uh, causing, a, a, uh, causing it to rotate and to make electricity, well here it's making ATP. Well, if you think about it, right, there needs to be a, um, a way to get the electrons out of this electron transport chain, otherwise they would get uh, jammed up like a traffic jam. And what happens here at complex four is that an enzyme facilitates the uh, reduction of oxygen. So oxygen is going to gain those electrons and two hydrogen protons and become water. So the oxygen actually gets split and it's going to be um, added two uh, electrons and two hydrogen protons and become H2O. So the oxygen you breathe is the final electron acceptor in this uh, electron transport chain and it'll become water. Um, one thing that's important to know is that it doesn't always have to be oxygen. Sometimes it could be sulfur or other um, elements, but inside of us and inside of the majority of eukaryotes, it will be oxygen. And so this is why it's called aerobic respiration. Aerobic means with oxygen. The inner mitochondrial membrane um, is left over from the endosymbiotic event uh, that brought in mitochondria to the cell. And the outer mitochondrial membrane more uh, resembles the uh, membrane of a eukaryotic cell because it was encompassed it. And so this space in between um, is going to be called the intermembrane space. So don't get confused if the picture is upside down, et cetera. You just need to look for the words and figure out where things are going. 
for example, look, right, and there's going to be many folds here, right? The many folds are called cristae. Those are going to increase the surface area at which the ATP synthesis can happen. And one misnomer is that many students look at a textbook picture and think that there's just one or two mitochondria per cell, there could be thousands, right? And so here, the protons, this is just another reminder, are going to be pumped in this inner membrane space. They will then be in high concentration and it'll be um, a different pH and they're all positively charged. So they will diffuse through um, ATP synthase. We talked about um, uncoupling proteins uh, very quickly here and how some diet pills like 2,4-dinitrophenol work by trying to uncouple this uh, inner mitochondrial membrane so that the hydrogen protons can rush through. And that's going to provide heat, right? And that heat is because of the kinetic energy of the movement of these protons. Um, so this could be good in babies and in brown fat to keep us warm. But it can be bad in the forms of that diet pill, right? Because it's an uncontrolled process and you can literally burn yourself up from the inside out. And so you'll read tragic stories of medical students who understood the process of what was happening, but they still took the diet pill anyway. So don't do that. All right. Um, let's see. Fermentation. So fermentation is really important. And so if you don't have oxygen, you can't do the electron transport chain here. Um, and so that's going to shut down. Uh, the Krebs cycle shut down and the cell is going to run out of NAD+. And there's no way to oxidize NADH back into NAD+. So in your body, you're going to do lactic acid fermentation. So you can take that, that glucose molecule, you do the process of glycolysis, there's 10 enzymatic steps, right? You're going to make a uh, pyruvate and it's going to make some ATP to keep you going. But you need to regenerate NAD+. So to, this is tricky. To regenerate NAD+, you need to oxidize NADH. To regenerate NAD+, you need to oxidize NADH. You need to get rid of those electrons. So there's going to be an enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase, that's going to take the electrons and the hydrogen proton from NADH, dump them back onto pyruvate, uh, change some chemical bonds, and that is then going to become lactate. Lactate will immediately dissociate into lactic acid in your body. And so there's some debate on whether or not that's what you feel as a, a cramp in muscles. In yeast and in some bacteria, they will do a similar process, right? It's going to take glucose. It's going to do the 10 steps to make pyruvate. But once again, we need to regenerate NAD+. We need to oxidize the NADH. We have run out of the empty taxi cabs. So to do that, there's going to be an enzyme that's going to, um, first of all, pyruvate is going to be converted to acetaldehyde. It's going to give off carbon dioxide, which makes uh, beer have bubbles, and it's going to make uh, bread rise. And then um, the electrons and the hydrogen are going to be put on this acetaldehyde to become ethanol. And that ethanol is alcohol. All right. Um, one thing I did not go over well enough in our class, and I apologize, is um, that different macromolecules can enter this uh, the cellular respiration in different steps. Right, and so carbohydrates can enter in glycolysis, obviously. Um, and if you look at the different steps of glycolysis, I'm not going to go all the way back in the slides, but you can see where different uh, carbs can enter in. Um, amino acids can enter in in the, the link reaction or in the um, citric acid cycle, and same with fatty acids can enter in there as well. So think about it, right? If you are without a energy input, you need to keep making ATP. Uh, for your body, otherwise you will shut down and die and succumb to entropy. And so you're going to burn up all the carbohydrates you have. You're then going to start burning up uh, fats and proteins. So when you lose weight, you actually lose uh, carbon dioxide and water. It comes out of it. All right. And then how is it regulated? Um, we You saw the feedback controls earlier with the arrows and the blocks. I think that those are really important. And then you can also think about tying it into unit four, right? Hormonal control of glucose entering into the cell. So you're going to have uh, insulin, which is going to come by and say, hey, glucose, you can now come into the cell. We had this big meal. Um, so this, for some reason, doesn't work in diabetics. They either don't make insulin um, in their pancreas or their body is not responding well to it. All right. All right. We are on to the third part here. So we've done energy, enzymes, uh, cellular respiration. Now we're on to photosynthesis, right? 
So there's a Verisatium video that the physics teacher turned me on to about where does a tree get its mass from? And if you ask a lot of people that, you'll get a lot of different answers. I wouldn't do it in a condescending way, but in a way that we just need to think about biology, right? And where, where does it come from? And I would ask you that. I'm not going to give you the answer here. Uh, I want you to deduce it and to figure it out and make an argument. All right, why are they a cycle? So we went over this a little bit earlier. Um, and you might remember from my ninth grade class, if you took me, that the products of photosynthesis are the reactants of cellular respiration and vice versa. The products of cellular respiration are the reactants of photosynthesis. So here you can see them. But there's many, many cycles going on, right? There's the um, cycles there between photosynthesis and cellular respiration, and there's cycles within photosynthesis. And many systems in nature often work this way, and it's more energetically favorable. And so here there's going to be a cycle between the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. The light-dependent reactions are going to make ATP and NADPH, which the Calvin cycle will use as it's fixing um, CO2 to uh, remove phosphate and making glucose. And then it's going to send back the reactants for the light reactions, the ADP and the NADP+. So you can think of NADP+, plus as um, just like NADH that we learned about in cellular Respiration is going to um, play a role in the redox reactions. So it's going to, when it's NADP uh, P plus, it will be reduced. It will gain electrons to become NADPH. When it's NADPH, it will be oxidized and NADP plus. So let's get into both the light independent reaction, or excuse me, the light dependent. It requires light and the Calvin cycle in more detail. But you um, should understand the equation here. So uh, here, carbon dioxide is going to be reduced. It's going to gain electrons, become uh, glucose, and water is going to be oxidized. It's going to lose its electrons in the process of photolysis and become oxygen, right? And so this oxygen is what we breathe. It's a byproduct of photosynthesis. Um, the light energy is captured by chlorophyll and excites the electrons, and light energy is going to be converted to chemical energy in glucose. Okay, um, the absorption spectrum. So another fun lab that hopefully we can do in person at some point. Um, we'll be taking leaves and scratching them with uh, coins on chromatography paper and then putting them in a solvent. We can see the different pigments inside of plants. And you'll see that um, plants uh, reflect green light, right? but they absorb or they're capable of absorbing the other colors in the spectrum. And so that's why most plants are green. Not all of them, but most. And so these uh, lights in the violet, blue, and red portions are most effective in driving photosynthesis. But plants will have a variety of pigments in them so that they, they can get um, uh, energy from different wavelengths of light. Um, this comes from the 2013 test. So I threw in uh, bacteria hydopsin, which is a protein used by archaea bacteria or purple bacteria, which are best absorbing green light. So this is kind of cool, right? They're, these bacteria absorb green light, um, and so they look purple, um, and they're still doing photosynthesis, which is pretty cool. Um, getting into the evolution of plants and why are they green and why are they not black, right? Why don't they just absorb all the light? It's pretty interesting, um, but outside the scope of this unit, uh, that I encourage you to research. Okay, here is where the action takes place. This is a chloroplast. Um, and you should be able to compare and contrast chloroplasts and mitochondria. Uh, chloroplast is often also an endosymbiotic event, as shown by Lynn Margulis. It was the second one, right, because all plants have mitochondria, but not all animals have chloroplasts. Right? They don't. Um, uh, and so here, um, it's going to have two membranes, just like the mitochondria. It's going to have an inner and an outer membrane. These thylakoids are that look like green pancakes in here are going to be the site of the light dependent reactions. A stack of them is called um, granum and then many granum are called grana. The stroma is the fluid on the enzyme that on the inside of the chloroplast is full of the enzymes needed to do the Calvin cycle. So here, let's see what's going on in the light-dependent reactions. So this should look very familiar because it looks just like cellular respiration. So how cool is that? So here you're going to have these photosystems, and these photosystems are going to be proteins that are going to hold chlorophyll. And it's going to, light is going to hit it. And this light is going to energize electrons inside of it. 
and eventually the electrons will leave and go through this electron transport chain. The electrons need to be replaced, and so they'll be replaced by the photolysis or the splitting of water into oxygen and hydrogen protons. These hydrogen protons are then stripped off of the, um, excuse me, the electrons are stripped off the hydrogen proton and are replaced the energized electrons in the chlorophyll molecule. So you start to get an accumulation of H pluses on the inside. These electrons, as they go through the electron transport chain, just like in um, the mitochondria, will pump hydrogen protons against their concentration gradient into the inner part of the thylakoid. So here's the difference, right? In the mitochondria, it was pumped to the inner membrane space, the outside. But here in photosynthesis, it's pumped to the inside. At photosystem one, the electrons will get recharged. And here they will go along the chain until they get to NADP plus reductase where the electrons will join up with NADP+. So in other words, they will reduce NADP+, into NADPH, so two electrons and a hydrogen proton. The hydrogen protons in here will diffuse through ATP synthase and make ATP. So these um, light-dependent reactions have made NADPH, a high-energy electron carrying molecule, and ATP for the Calvin site. There is a process called, um, this was, that was non-cyclic electron flow. It, was a, it, was, it wasn't a cycle. It just went straight through. But there could be a cycle in here as well. And so um, the chloroplast can just continuously excite the electrons here in photosystem one and keep using that to make ATP. And if it does that, it's not going to um, uh, make NADPH. Sorry, it's covered up down here. All right, um, I think that's uh, not in the unit guide though, so, um, but I'll check that and talk about that in class. All right, here we go. So here's the big picture of the light dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. And so here you can see NADPH and ATP going off to the Calvin cycle to be used in a process of making sugars. The Calvin cycle is, uh, the steps of it are not required on the AP test. Um, I do think there's a really good TED ed on this and how it works and you can follow the carbons around. Um, I encourage you to get like little Play-Doh uh, and to make like this, the, um, to make the ribulus phosphate and to move them around and see what's going on. So Rubisco is uh, one of the most important enzymes on earth. It's going to take carbon dioxide and it's going to fix it to RUBP. Then um, the plant is going to use ATP and NADPH. I guess I shouldn't say plant, anything that's photosynthetic um, could be uh, a protist as well. And it's going to alter this around so that way it is now reduced. So that way it's gaining these high energy electrons and it's going to then be able to exit and become glucose. But a bunch of them continue back forward here to regenerate uh, RUBP. So this is more energetically favorable than taking individual carbon dioxides and trying to glue them together. It's better to work in this process. You can think about it like a factory. It's better to have um, the assembly line going here. Um, so one thing that was interesting, and you can talk to any of your students in class, is uh, that Rubisco um, can also grab onto oxygen. And so if... Uh, if there isn't abundant CO2, then Rubisco can grab onto oxygen, which is bad for the plant, because then it doesn't make glucose. It makes a waste product that has to be processed. And so this is uh, called photorespiration and leads to some interesting evolutionary uh, trends here, right? And so in places that are really hot, like here in Oman, um, plants can't leave their stomata open all the time to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen because at the stomata, at the holes in the leaves, Water also escapes, um, and that water escapes through evapotranspiration. Remember that water is going up. We learned in Unit 2 through um, uh, the xylem uh, due to cohesion and adhesion as the uh, polarity of water has a bond to itself. And so um, plants that can't lose out of water can close those, but then you could have this problem with photorespiration. So it's interesting um, how plants have evolved different pathways to deal with this, and so that would be um, the CAM pathway or C4 pathway. Okay, 
we're almost here. So these slides I did borrow from another teacher. I'll put that review in there on fitness. And so <clears throat> what this one was going at is just that variation at the molecular level provides organisms with the ability to respond to a variety of environmental stimuli. And so I think it's tacked on here because you can see the different pigments in plants, right? Allows them greater flexibility in absorbing incoming wavelengths of light. Um, some other examples would be different types of phospholipids in a cell membrane, so the organism flexibility to adapt to different environmental temperatures. And then I believe I mentioned briefly in class uh, fetal hemoglobin versus adult hemoglobin, which is going to maximize oxygen absorption in organisms at different stages. And so uh, the fetal hemoglobin would need to have a stronger affinity for oxygen right, to get it from. Um, all right, students, check out those questions I posed to you. I'm going to, I'll try and edit the video on the redox part. Take care. Have a great rest of the break.